Great. Fantastic. So Danielle, we're excited to have you here as part of our healthy living experience in partnership with the city of Sterling Heights. Um, we are creating a month long of activities for our residents and our community to make us all healthier and safer. Um, usually we do an expo and we're all in person, but um, this is a, 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 the next best thing is having us all together. So Danielle, we're looking forward. I had a great conversation back a couple months ago with Danielle from Make Food Not Waste and learned about all of the great work they are doing to prevent our food from ending up in the landfills. And so I am a product of someone that every Sunday afternoon will head to the fruit market and buy a lot of produce. And then by Thursday, is fearful that she is going to have to throw it out. So Danielle and her team are going to share all kinds of tips and resources for us so that I don't do that um, every week. <laughs> and so I learn, I find ways to utilize all of this healthy and great food that I have so it does not end up in the landfill. So Danielle Todd, I will let you tell anything more about Make Food Not Waste. You have the floor and you have our audience. Great. So again, thank you for being here, participating with us. Yeah, I am so excited to be here. I as you'll come to find in the next short time that we have to get today that there's nothing I love more than talking about food waste. So thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Uh, so today we're gonna talk about, just like Stacy said, what do you do when you have that small household and you're shopping for one or two people and you're cooking for one or two people and you find yourself sometimes at the end of the week or on that Thursday with all this food that you bought, you had the best of intentions and now you find yourself throwing it away. So we're gonna talk about that today. We're gonna talk about some tips of uh, shopping uh, as well as how to store it so that it lasts as long as possible. And then when it comes time to use it, so cooking it and, and how, to how to really enjoy it. Uh, but before that, like Stacey said, uh, I'm from Make Food Not Waste, and I'll tell you a little bit about us. Uh, we're a four-year-old organization. We work primarily in Detroit, but we do pop up around Southeast Michigan as we are here today. And uh, really we started out as a group that wanted to help people like you who are maybe struggling at home. You know, you find yourselves with with food that you, like I said, that you're throwing away. Uh, and what we're all seeing right now is that the cost of food is really going up. So it's even more important to make sure that all those dollars that you spend on the food, you're actually consuming it and you're not wasting it and throwing that money in the garbage. So that's how we got our start. So we've been doing that for the past few years. We do classes like today, we do uh, different events, although the past year, of course, we haven't really been in person. We're looking forward to looking forward to the expo in person next summer. But um, you know, so we've we've done uh, events and and classes. But we've what we've also added in the, this past year is a kitchen. Our kitchen is located in the Jefferson Avenue Presbyterian Church, which is in Indian Village. And that's a space for us to take in a, all that surplus food that happens at the retail level, at the commercial level, that maybe needs a little bit of love before it goes back out to the community. So we have tremendous food rescue organizations in the area that capture a lot of that fresh food and get it right out to people. But sometimes there's food that's still edible and nutritious, but it just needs to be processed. Maybe it's bananas that are very brown or it's produce that's a little mature, a little too ripe, but you can still turn it into breads and smoothies and different meals for people. So that's what we do in our kitchen. So I invite any of you who are interested in learning more about us, you can check out our website, which is makefoodnotwaste.org. Uh, you can contact me, uh, Danielle, at makefoodnotwaste.org. I'd be happy to tell you a little bit more about our organization. Uh, but just a note about food waste and why we do what we do. So we are, um, oddly enough, first and foremost, an environmental organization. And we really seek to put things in place so that food isn't going to waste. And, and the reason why it's so important that food doesn't go to waste is because it really is a significant environmental problem. That's not something that people really associate with uh, when we think about climate change and environmental issues, we tend to think about things like energy or transportation. But the reason why food is so critical to that and when we think about solving climate change is because when we throw food away into the landfill, we're essentially throwing away all of the resources that went into that food. So one of the statistics that I always find shocking is that it takes 55 gallons of water to produce one egg. 
So when you find yourself throwing away an egg, you've wet, now wasted 55 gallons of water. And, and so Stacy has that look on her face that says, how on earth is that possible? Well, you think about how does an egg get to us? It's the chicken, the chicken needs uh, to eat grain that's water intensive, the chickens watered, the, um, all of the resources that go into the ground. And so the net result is that you find that one egg takes 55 gallons of water. So it's, it's, um, it, it's kind of staggering when, you know, for, for those of us, and that's most of us that don't engage in growing our own food, that uh, how many resources really go into producing that food? The other environmental reason is that why this is important is because when we put food into landfills and it decomposes, it produces methane, which is a greenhouse gas. So that's part of the reason why our climate is so hot is we have this gas, we have this, essentially a blanket over the earth that traps this gas in and methane uh, contributes to that. So when you have food in landfills, it produces methane. When you put food in composting, it doesn't create that methane. So if anything, if you if you do find yourself with food, composting it is the, is the best thing to do. Anything you can do to keep it out of the landfill. So with all that, let's get into how we can enjoy our food so we don't have to landfill it or even compost it. And like I said, we're gonna be talking today about three main areas of shopping, storing, and using. So the first thing uh, that I would like to say is, feel free to ask any questions as we go along the way. Tom's gonna to be monitoring the chat. Tom, please feel free to interrupt me at any time and I uh, can answer any specific questions that people have. But the first thing I want you to just think about, you could put it in the chat if you like, or just think about it in, in your own mind is, think about when it comes to that Thursday, like Stacey said, or it comes to the end of the week and you're about to go grocery shopping and you're cleaning out your fridge or you're clear, clearing off your counter and you're, about to head to the grocery store and you picture yourself when you're throwing that food into your garbage. What is that food and how did it get there? How did you get to the point that that happened? Is it, uh, and everyone's different, you know, sometimes it's, I went to the farmer's market, I had the best of intentions, the produce looked amazing, I know I need to eat healthy, I know I need to eat more vegetables, but work got it away from me this week and I got home late, I didn't feel like cooking or I put it in my drawer, in my refrigerator, I totally forgot about it. When I opened it up, it was all slimy because it was greens. Uh, you know, every, just think about what, what comes to mind when, uh, what's behind it. And, and really that's the best, that's the be most important first step because if you can think about your specific situation, you can think about what interventions you can take and what you can change that's possibly more a little simple that, that can help you cut down on how much you're throwing away. And so keep those in mind as we go through these tips and tricks because some of these will really speak to you and some of them may not, and that's okay. So just try to think through maybe you know two or three of these as we go through and, and, and which ones really, uh, really are pinpoint to what you're doing in your home and what you can what you can do easily to make some changes. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is shopping. And um, the first step is related to that question, which is be honest with yourself. <laughs> so really think about, do you eat those four or five bananas when you buy the bunch? Or do you really only get through one a week? How many, How? what's realistic for you to eat? Are you, um, are you actually eating those those perishable fruits and vegetables or do you did you think you were going to buy eat the brussels sprouts and the truth is you don't really like them and you just bought them because they were on sale or they look good or you thought it would be good for you to do so the best thing you can do is really just and you don't have to tell anybody but just be honest with yourself what what really are you eating and that will help you by the right amount. So you can just buy a little bit of, you know, you can buy one banana or you can buy uh, just one piece of chicken breast from the, from the counter uh, instead of buying that giant package that is really built for families of four or five. Uh, you can buy little bits of, uh, you know, sometimes I know Kroger will sell single 
stalks of celery, single carrots, so that you don't have to buy the whole bunch. So try to match that, uh, the amount that you're buying with what's realistic that you're going to eat. The other thing that uh, is related to that is uh, utilizing the salad bar. So the salad bar kind of went away during COVID. I've noticed that it does seem to be coming back a little bit. And uh, the benefit of that is that you can buy small amounts of different vegetables. And so instead of buying that giant head of broccoli, you can maybe buy just a little, you know, a few florets that might be good as a side dish or might be good in an omelet, something that still helps you get that greenery without committing to a giant head or a giant bag of, of produce. Um, also utilize, utilizing frozen vegetables. So frozen food really got a bad rap. And you know, certainly I know when I was growing up, frozen vegetables were not uh, considered you know, it, the, the, the emphasis was really on fresh, but frozen vegetables have come a long way. And, and, and sometimes frozen vegetables can have more nutrition even than fresh vegetables, oddly enough, because a lot of times the frozen vegetables are frozen right at the moment that they're picked. So they're frozen at that peak of freshness, as opposed to say, your lettuce that you bought at the grocery store that comes from California, it was picked and then it was transported. And by the time you get it, maybe a week or 10 days after it's been picked. Uh, so sometimes those frozen vegetables can even be better for you. The beauty of the frozen vegetables, of course, is that you can open up the bag, take out just as much as you need or as little as you need. And you don't, again, you don't have to commit to a big, uh, big something of, of that, fresh, uh, that fresh vegetables. Uh, the last thing I will say in the shopping category is meal planning. So meal planning is, again, goes back to that really knowing yourself and taking a look at your schedule for the week. How often are you going to be home for dinner? Are you going to be, um, you know, nowadays where a lot of us are eating lunch at home, but with people going back to the office, that may change. Uh, you might be on the road more. You're maybe you're... Um, you, know, you might have meetings or you might be going out at night. So, uh, so really taking a look at what your schedule is like and how you, how, how you'll, um, how you'll be able to utilize each meal throughout the week. Also making a plan for your leftovers. So if you know that you're going to cook something that's maybe a little bit larger, how are you going to use that leftover? You may intend to use your leftover on purpose. So for example, if you're going to have rice one night with dinner, you can make that, that you can make a whole serving of that would serve four, keep some of that rice, and it's great in fried rice the next day. The thing about uh, fried rice is it actually needs the cold rice from a day or two before. So you wouldn't make fried rice with fresh rice you would use it with leftover rice specifically. So that's another great way you can plan in advance of how you're gonna use those leftovers and continue to make more meals out of it, either for lunch or for dinner. So I'll stop here about shopping. Does anyone have any tips to share with the group about how you shop and how some, some hacks and some ideas that you've come up with that really help when you're shopping for just say one or two in your household? Daniel, I had a... I was, gonna, I was gonna say, we started doing the meal planning, just like being real on Sundays, going through, because we're both so busy, uh, my girlfriend and I. So we'll, we'll, we'll do like, okay, I know on Thursday we're not making dinner. So we just don't even, don't even plan on it. We just go mm -hmm. ahead and chalk that one up as we're gonna have to have to find something else. So the meal planning is, is key. I never Perfect. thought about buying one banana though. I guess yeah. you can do that, but it never really crossed my yeah. mind that you can yep. buy things in, in such a smaller package. Yeah, absolutely. I had a, a friend who would say when her, her elderly mother, when she would take her grocery shopping, again, was buying for herself and she would buy five bananas, but one was green. One was the green, the, the greenest she could find. One was the next stage green so that she could make her bananas last five days. Mm -hmm. But she bought literally, one had to have yellow dots, like, or black, like, you know, each stage is a banana ripened. And that way she knew that by Friday, that greenest banana was going to be what she ate. Perfect. Just a little bit of time, but, um, you know, yeah. I mean, and granted, I became the queen of banana bread during the pandemic because, you know, 72 ways to make banana bread <laughs> when you have those extra, extra bananas on your counter. Lots of banana bread and you can freeze banana bread too. So that's another way to, for, sometimes it's hard to get through the whole loaf at once. So if you, you slice it and freeze Muffins it. And frozen. Yep. I have a question. 
Mm -hmm. I have two, um, two teenage, well, two young adults at home. One is not typically there. He's only there for summer vacation. He goes to school. So it's my daughter and I, there are weeks where my kids will eat apples, bananas, all the fruit. Then they'll be like, we need more. So I'll go and I'll get it. And then no one will eat them. Right. This is a problem in my house. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty common too. And, and I would say, you know, if you find yourself with a week like that, you can, you can freeze it. You can freeze your fruit, Mm -hmm. you know, chop it up, freeze it, put it in smoothies. You can actually also add it to banana bread. So you can make like a strawberry banana bread. You know, you can use that up. Uh, Pancakes. I've tried that banana chocolate chip pancakes, mashing it up. Yeah. But um, can you freeze? You can't once the banana, like you couldn't mash banana and put it in the freezer to use in a recipe at a future date, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't last. You can, the way we do it is we'll peel it and freeze it whole. And then when you, you can either, then you you can use it in a smoothie or you can let it defrost a little bit and mash it then and it'll be fine. Yeah. Take the peel off first because it's hard. It's really hard to get the peel off when it's frozen and it also turns really brown and black and it looks terrible, but, um, but the fruit inside will be fine. So peel Mm -hmm. it first, put it in the freezer, and then you can just mash it up and use it later for sure. All right. Thank Mm -hmm. you. We do that a lot in our kitchen at the church too. So we get in so many brown, almost black bananas because you can't hand it to people and the it's just not nice to give to people. And, uh, and there's only so much banana bread that the community can, you know, you can't say to a family, here's six bananas, make, three banana breads out of it. So we will store it all in our freezer. And then when it comes time to make big batches of banana bread, we'll, we'll do that. We'll peel it and freeze it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, those kids are pesky. They do that all the time. And, and fruit's the worst because they, they go on a kick. My daughter went on a kick of um, mangoes. And it was the same thing, you know, weeks and weeks of buying mangoes. And then I would buy mangoes and they would just sit there and she wouldn't eat them. <laughs> so involve them in the, in the meal planning, maybe say, I'm going to go to the store this week. What do you, you're on the hook. What are you going to eat? Typical kid, right? Change their mind 10 times. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Um, so the next thing we'll go on to is how to store your foods to, to, uh, help prolong it as much as possible. And that's really an issue when it comes to perishable food, right? Because you buy these fruits and vegetables and they they do have a shorter shelf life, uh, especially if you are shopping local as is now's the time to do it. And the, and the fruits and vegetables are great. Uh, they, they are gonna last less long than uh, those sort of industrial commercial fruits and vegetables that you buy in the grocery store. So, um, so again, you know, try not, to, Try not to buy too much, even though it's so tempting, <laughs> but, um, but certain things that you can do to, to help it along. Uh, one of the questions that we get most often is where do I store it? Do I put it on the counter? Do I put it in the fridge? Do, does it need to be in a cupboard? Is it dark? Is it cool? Is it hot? You know, what are all those things? The, the best rule of thumb that we recommend is think about how the grocery store sells it. So if it's sold to you on the, on the walls in the, where it's cool, put it in your fridge. If it's out in the middle and it's not refrigerated, put it on your counter. Tomatoes on your counter, not in the fridge. Your, um, your berries, the berries, they tend to leave out, but I usually put mine in the fridge. But as, as a general rule, you know, keep your follow the way the grocery store does it. They do that on purpose, of course, because they want it to last as long as possible. So, so counter and cool, follow how they do it. The other tool that's really important is of course your freezer. So we talked about that a little bit with freezing the bananas and freezing your fruits and vegetables. Uh, you can, I, what's funny to me is that you could even freeze lettuce and um, you can put it in Ziploc bags, freeze it, and you can, people put lettuce in smoothies, which I can't say that I've tried. It sounds really strange to me, but I guess it's, you know, especially if you have a hearty green, like a romaine, then it's similar to you putting kale in your smoothies or spinach in your smoothies. So you can, you can actually freeze your lettuce. Um, lettuce is one of those things, you know, you, you buy that giant bag, there's just no way you're gonna get through it in time before it turns slimy. So try when you can to buy those smaller heads of lettuce where, where that's possible. Or 
again, use the salad bar. The other thing that you can do with your freezer is use these, you can see it here, uh, these, these portion size, these they're in portions. So single portions, if you make a big dish on a Sunday and you cut it into smaller portions for one or two people, you can put that in your freezer. It's easy to defrost. If you have a freezer to microwave safe container, you can put it straight into your microwave um, or even better if you can put it into your oven and warm it up slowly that way. Uh, the, the good rule of thumb is when you're reheating food is to reheat it in the same way that it was cooked. So if you baked it, warm it up in the oven. If you fried it, warm it up in your skillet on, on your stove, uh, follow, that, follow that, same, that same way. Um, okay, another great way to save uh, produce so that it will last longer is to use, this is a really cool thing. This, I got this at the container store. It's a produce keeper. And it, uh, you put your produce in here and it absorbs the ethylene gas that the uh, vegetables give off. And so that's what will keep it crisp. So you can, you know, you don't have to get at the container store. I don't, I don't get any kickback from the container store. You can get it on Amazon or, or wherever you shop. Um, but those produce keepers can really make a big difference too. And just, again, prolonging the life of those greens. Uh, they have them for berries. They have them for all sorts of things. So strategically using those tools can help it last just that little bit longer. And again, if you're buying local, that's going to become really important. Uh, Note about herbs. So herbs are really a pain because you buy them in those plastic shells and they have, you know, a, a lot in there. You may only use a little bit for your recipes, the basil, the thyme, the oregano, and then you're left with all those extra herbs and you find that you just end up throwing them out, which is, which is frustrating. Uh, you can uh, you can store them better, and if you take them out of that clamshell or that that plastic container that they come in, wrap them in a paper towel and store them in a plastic bag in your fridge will help them last a little bit longer. You can also invest in one of those arrow gardens. I don't know if you've seen those, but they're they're like little indoor um, hydroponic gardens that will that have a light and they have a water system. You can choose which herbs that maybe there's certain herbs that you use more often than others like basil or dill, uh, thyme, you can put little pods in there and then you, they just grow and you can snip them off and use them as, as needed. It's like having a little plant inside. Certainly you can grow things on a windowsill, but if you don't have a windowsill, the Aero Garden is good, especially for places like Michigan, where we don't really have sun for nine months of the year. <laughs> so uh, that's a nice addition to, to, can be a nice addition to your kitchen. If it grows too much, as mine tended to do over the past few months, it's a nice thing to share with neighbors and friends, uh, some fresh herbs, and you say, look, this is what I grew in my garden. They say, how did you do that? It's February. And you say, oh, it's just my little secret. But the Aero Garden can be kind of a, a fun way to, um, to have those fresh herbs uh, often. Uh, so I got to jump in. Are you, so you yeah. vouch for the Aero Garden? I've seen these a lot and I've been really interested. I've just thought like, there's no way this I, really works because the pictures have all of these like beautiful vegetables growing out of it. But like, I always thought no way, but you, it's true. It's true. Yeah, right. it's pretty cool. I got one this winter as my uh, Christmas present to myself, and it's been totally worth it. It grows my like crazy. My eyes drift over this way. It's because I'm putting one in a shopping cart. Let so me see if I can if I can show you my my arrow garden. No, I can't. I can't twist far enough. But we'll have um, to take your word for it. But I believe you. Yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah. it's great because we, you know, you can like I said, you can just snip off what you use, what you want, and um, and it and it really takes care of itself. You just have to water, add water to it, and add food every two weeks. A little capsule. It's yeah, cool. it's pretty cool. And you get, and they come in different sizes. So you can get small, you know, small personal, personal herb size. It's pretty fun. Yep. Um, the last really cool hack that I came across for uh, for if you're trying to conserve and you're and you have that small household is you know it, I, I don't know if you've heard about that you can freeze milk but you can but um, certainly if you're going to freeze a gallon of milk that's not really helpful because then you have to defrost the whole thing but you can freeze milk in ice cube trays 
you freeze it and then you can have it for your coffee or tea the next morning. So instead of having to commit to a whole container of milk, if maybe you, you know, you only use it for your coffee or tea, or you, you might just have, you, you're not getting through it fast enough, you can, uh, again, freeze those in ice cubes and then you can have them whenever you need it. Same goes, same, same for herbs too. You can, uh, you can chop them up like basil and mix it with olive oil and freeze those. And then you can just pop those in sauces as another way that you can extend the length of herbs. Danielle, I did that with milk a lot during the pandemic because I am not a huge milk drinker, but wanted to have it in the house just in case, mm -hmm. um, you know, I didn't know when I'd get my next trip to the store and I would freeze it in one cup portions in freezer Ziploc bags Perfect. and lay it flat. So that yeah. way if I was baking or cooking, I had portion controlled milk and you know, it allowed me to get it past that expiration date. Yep. Yep. That's, that's a perfect. And, and, um, and I, and that's a great segue into expiration dates. So one of the things that, uh, that we, that we all just sort of instinctively do is when we see that date on containers that we, we think of it as that's the last date that it can be used. What's crazy about those dates is that they're actually not required by the federal government or usually state governments. It is a manufacturer process. So the manufacturers will put the dates on perishable items primarily for the grocery stores to help them manage their inventory. And the date on there usually means it's the peak of the taste and freshness of the item. So it's, it's misleading because it makes it, it sort of implies that the next day, if you drink it or eat it, you'll, you'll make yourself sick. And that's actually not the case. The best thing that you can do when, you, when it is past that date is to use your senses. So if it, if it looks bad, so if it's green or just funky, look chunky, <laughs> you know, definitely don't drink or eat it. If it smells bad, same kind of thing. If you give it a little bit of a taste, like yogurt sometimes is hard to know, if it smells bad because it has all the sugar in it and the flavoring in it, if you taste it and it tastes okay, then it's probably okay. Uh, if you are if you are a little nervous about it, you can always Google. So if you Google how many days past the sell-by date can I consume whatever it is, you know, meat, dairy, any of those items, there's lots of resources on the internet that'll give you that rule of thumb. It's typically, it's, you know, days, sometimes like eggs, I think are three weeks past the date is something so, so far past the date. Meat obviously is closer to the date, but other items you definitely can eat past that date. Another great way to not have to find yourself throwing food away is, is if you, uh, if just give it that kind of sniff and taste test. Uh, does anybody have other things to share about how you store food and keep it, keep it lasting longer? has some great ideas for shopping. I actually have a question um, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, you talked about keeping produce on the counter versus going into the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. Are there certain foods that should not be near each other? Um, so one of the things I noticed this winter is I was keeping clementines on my counter next to my bananas and my bananas mm -hmm. would turn so fast. And I found mm -hmm. out that there was a gas that the Clementines were emitting that was making the bananas turn faster. Are there other tips like that of things that should not be near each other? Yeah, the um, definitely potatoes and onions don't go together, and that's uh, and that's sort of you know, and that's what's mis kind of misleading is like you you would think they would go together because people say store them in a cool, dry place. That's what it says you know everywhere when you read about onions and potatoes, but they don't they don't actually like to be together. So keep your onions and potatoes separated. Uh, bananas do bananas react to other things around them. Um, I'm trying to think what the other one. I know there's something with the greens. But, avocados, um, avocados ripen really fast if they're there with other fruits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, just, I threw three out this morning. Yeah. Yeah. The fruits are, the fruits are tricky. Um, I, you know, as a general rule, you know, if you can keep things kind of away from each other, I, um, I, I always crack up about apples because, you know, the expression one bad apple and, and it's like, where did that come from is because a bad apple will actually spoil the whole bag. <laughs> so if you have, you know, a bowl of apples or you have them in a bag and you see one that's kind of getting a little, 
funky, you know, it's soft or it's got that kind of brown side, get them out of there because it, it will ruin the whole, the whole batch. So I guess that's where the expression comes from. Again, with apples though, I mean, if you have that kind of squishy side, if you just cut off that one piece, you can still of course enjoy the rest of the apple. Um, but you wanna, you, if, and if you're not gonna eat it right away, just move, move it away from the other apples, but definitely keep them away from, from the others. I learned that last week too. We, um, at one of our events, we were talking to our friends from Blake's um, farms. And one of the things they said is if they have a damaged, um, if you have a can of something that's damaged, Usually you just throw out that one case of whatever it is, but if you have a damaged case of apple, of their apple cider, their hard apple cider, they have to throw away the whole palate because there's something about the fermentation of the apples where it will ruin the rest of the palate oh, and the wow. taste. So it really is true about like one Jeez. bad apple can, yeah, can spoil yeah. a bunch. Isn't that funny? Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, although that's really terrible to have to throw out a whole palate, gosh. Right. Yeah, ooh, yeah, that's... Uh, and, and grocery stores do find themselves that stuff like that happens where they'll get shipments in and they'll open up a box and they'll see that one box is, is damaged and they will refuse the whole truck. And a lot of those times the trucks have nowhere to take all that food. And if it's, you know, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, whatever it is, and they historically would dump it. But fortunately now there are a lot of organizations around that will, that that they know about that they can contact and, and they have people like us who will go through it and sort and say like, okay, this is still okay. This is not okay. So it doesn't have to all get thrown out, but yeah, that happens all the time. It's crazy. And I think you mentioned this, but there's a big difference between an expiration date and a best buy date. Correct? Yeah. Yeah. So the, so the only, I think the only thing that has an expiration date is certainly the only thing that's federally required is baby formula. So, when you when you see dates, it it will say Best Buy, Use By, Sell By. They don't. I can't think of one that actually says expired. I'm trying to think if that's the case. Um, sometimes it'll just have a date, but usually it'll say Best Buy or Use By or Sell By, and that again just speaks to this is the date that has the optimum taste and nutrition. Having said that. That's also a little bit of a guess. So that's what the manufacturer is saying. Gosh, we think that this date is going to be the, you know, when it's going to taste the best, but it's not really an exact science. So that's why, again, you know, using your senses is really the better, the best thing to do. Okay, so we'll um, move on to cooking and using our food. So as you see, you know, a lot of what goes into all of this is is everything before you cook. So we think about not wasting is how, is how we cook, but really how you shop and how you store it is, is sets you up for success. But you find yourself, you're, you know, you've got all your food, okay, what are you gonna do with it? Uh, the first thing is if you uh, don't wanna get stuck in a position where you're eating just cereal for dinner or you're constantly getting prepared food or takeout or you're going out to eat, you wanna eat some stuff at home, but you don't wanna go through the trouble to make something so big and then you know you know it's just you or you and one other, uh, how are you gonna eat it? You again, go back to those, those portion sizes. So make something ahead of time, turn it into portions, put it in your freezer, it makes for a great, you know, late night during the week where you don't feel like cooking, you just take out that one meal and heat it up and have this delicious dinner that you made previously. So that's always a good thing. Um, sharing it with friends and family or neighbors. And, you know, that's as we're now all getting back into seeing people again and feeling more social, maybe in the past year, you realize that you actually really like people. And <laughs> It was really hard not to see them for the past year. And so this is a great opportunity to say, say to your neighbor, say to, you know, invite people over or, um, or ask them, say, hey, hey, I made all this and it's extra. Do you want half of my banana bread? And, and a lot of times people are really happy to have that. You know, they're happy to try something that they didn't have to make themselves that's home cooked. Uh, and it's a great way to use up the, the extra food and, and uh, keep those friendships and those relationships really strong because the way to people's hearts is through their stomach. So uh, another thing you can do is use, um, look for recipes that call for fewer ingredients. Uh, this is something that I learned when 
I was first starting out, uh, my husband and I, when I was first learning to cook, and so many recipes would have long lists of ingredients, and I would buy, go and buy all of it, and then I would be left with these, you know, half of this, or a quarter of that, or a bag of the, all these kind of random things, and I would never use them up. So really falling back on uh, trying to find those recipes that really are, uh, that, that aren't aren't ingredient intensive will help you not have so many ingredients left over. Conversely, if you can find recipes that are kind of like back-to-back -back recipes, so if you know that you can't help but buy, you know, you, you, you love asparagus and you, you know, you only need a few for one recipe that you're going to make, try to think about other ways that you can use up the rest of that asparagus bunch. Maybe you put it in um, an omelet. Maybe you put it in, uh, I guess you couldn't really put it in a case that that would be, I don't know if that would taste good, but things like omelets and quesadillas and smoothies are great vehicles for those kind of small bits that you have left over. So thinking about, um, the, uh, again, those recipes that don't have a lot of ingredients, how you can put them into other recipes, and, and those kind of versatile recipes that can take in anything that you, that you need, like that fried rice, or a stir fry, or a quesadilla, something that you kind of tuck a little bit into and, uh, and use that up. Um, the last thing that I'll say in this section really is, uh, again, you know, share as much as you can. Uh, you can also donate your fruits and vegetables to food banks and food pantry organizations. If you find yourself going on vacation and you have some food, uh, not, not all of them will take in the fresh food, but uh, certainly if you cook anything, you can't. You can't donate that. But if you do find yourself with apples or, you know, or, or greens or different things that you just couldn't get to, you're going away, a lot of places will take them in. Uh, we're one of those, but there, I'm sure there's places near you where, where you live that will, will take in that extra food. Uh, same thing with your pantry. Periodically go through, kind of take out stuff before those dates. Those have expiration dates on it, the cans. So um, try, to, try to donate those before the dates come due. Uh, COVID, now that we're coming out of COVID, it's a great time to go through your pantry because chances are you bought a lot of really weird stuff in this past year because you were nervous that there wasn't going to be any food. And I, I mean, I know that I bought things. I, I was, I bought stuff like it was the Armageddon, like I bought, you know, um, powdered egg. I mean, th just the craziest things because I thought we're not going to have you know, power and water and food, and I just bought the strangest stuff, and now, of course, it's still sitting there. So take take this time to go through and kind of fresh start summer, clean out, clean out some of your things. Um, okay, so we've got one last section, but before we get to that, any other, any questions, any other ideas that, that you all have to share before we go into some, some recipe ideas? No, but I can commiserate with your overbuying. So I have two giant containers of pop, unpopped popcorn. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love popcorn, but I, you know, and I couldn't find it for a while. So then when I found it, I, you know, stocked up, but I too had powdered milk, powdered eggs. Yep. I, yep. you couldn't find yeast for a while. So right. I had yeast in my fridge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like pain, my friend. Yeah. You are not alone. <laughs> there's a lot of, there's a lot. And, and, and strange things too. I bought, you know, big bags of dried pepper. I mean, the stuff that I don't even know how to cook with them and I, now I have them. So I guess I need to figure that out so I don't let it go to waste. <laughs> now here comes the creative part, right? That's right, that's what's fun. Okay, the, um, the last thing that I wanted to share was, uh, and this this one is, is something that, that we find that people love is how do you make five meals out of one chicken? So uh, this can be if you buy a rotisserie chicken or maybe you buy a whole chicken and you cook it on you know, a Sunday or so and how can you, get, how can you enjoy it all week with, from just one chicken, which seems crazy. So, uh, so the first thing that we would, the first recipe of course is to roast your chicken. Uh, you can find lots of recipes online for, for ways you can roast, you can flavor it, you can do it, you can do it plain, but uh, roast that chicken the first night and slice off some of the breast, 
or if you prefer a leg or, you know, in different, different parts of the chicken, have a little bit of that chicken the first night with, of course, your vegetables on the side. Uh, then the next couple days, you can turn that chicken meat into other things. You can make it into a chicken salad. Uh, it's lots of different flavors for chicken salad, not just mayonnaise, but you can put in dill, you can put in curry flavoring to kind of zip it up a little bit. Also turning it into a chicken quesadilla. So that's just a matter of taking a tortilla, putting that cooked chicken in it. You can put grated cheese in there. You can put some vegetables in there. Uh, oil both sides of the tortillas. And you know, after you make a sandwich out of it, of course, put it in a skillet until the cheese melts and you'll have a delicious chicken quesadilla. Uh, and then another fun way to use up that chicken meat is on a baked potato. So bake a potato, chop up the chicken, you can put some broccoli in it maybe too, or some cheese and you can have a full meal uh, again with that chicken meat. And the last recipe is to make a broth. So take all those bones, save all those bones, cook it in some, submerge it in water, Great if you can put in some celery or some, you know, carrots. That's also a great way to use up your, the, that bendy celery that you know that you have in your fridge because everyone has bendy celery in their fridge. Put it in, put in that stock with some pepper, whole peppercorns and a bay leaf. Simmer it for a few hours, and now you have a delicious broth. You can add some cooked pasta to it, or you can, if you have some of that leftover chicken meat, you can chop up the chicken meat and put that in there as well. So that's a great way. So now you've got five different meals from just one chicken. It's like it's amazing how how far that chicken can go. That's all I have for you today, but I'm happy to take any questions about what we talked about today, about the organization, about other things you can do, just would, would love to hear what you think and would also love to hear as you as we went through all this, which, which two or three things really stand out to you that you think you, that really spoke to you, that you feel that you can incorporate pretty easily into your kitchen. Do you have any <laughs> like meal prep tips? That's my issue. Oh, well. I just am so low on time. I'm just Have always running all over the place. So I'd like to get things like prepared so it's good to go. So if you have any suggestions on, uh, Susan kind of touched on this in the chat too, just being like so busy. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how I can get a little bit more organized in like, like that way? Yeah, you know, the, a lot of times people will talk about taking those Sundays and, and or when you come home from the grocery store and, and just chopping everything up ahead of time and putting it in your fridge. I always feel like on Sundays, that's kind of the last thing I want to do personally. I mean, it's the weekend and it's just, it just can feel like more work. So that might be an opportunity to take advantage of those things like the salad bar or the frozen vegetables or things that are already chopped up for you. Um, a lot of stores will, you can buy, you know, chopped things that are, that are ready to go. Sometimes that can, th those shortcuts can really help and really make a difference. Okay. I think Dave had a question and was trying to talk and I just rudely stepped on him. So Dave, if you are there and can unmute and have that question. One of the questions that I had uh, or comments back, back on your other thing was with the, the chicken, you could also, you know, use it for like a chili or, or leftover vegetables and such. Yeah. Uh, was another, you know, that, that's, that's what I idea. tend to do. That's a great idea. Uh, and yeah. And then one of the other things that I do is uh, when I cut my vegetables, um, I'll put them in water to make them last longer so that they don't turn brown. Um, mm -hmm. I've, uh, my brother kind of taught that to me back probably 15 years ago, and it, it really does work. So, mm -hmm. nice too. Yeah, and along those lines, too, if you, if you do find yourself with some greens that are kind of limp, like salad greens, you can swish them in, in cold water for a few minutes and that'll oftentimes bring them back to life a little bit. So water water is really helpful for that kind of stuff, for sure. And yep. chili is great to freeze. So not everything freezes really well, but chili is one of those items that will freeze well. Very cool. Years ago, we started using mason jars to store lettuce mm -hmm. and if you, you have to clean the lettuce. I, we usually typically would buy romaine. And so you would wash it and clean it and cut it and then jam it, try to get as much into a mason jar as you possibly can. And I remember the first test we did, we put a date on the top of the jar and I think it lasted about three weeks and still had oh the same freshness that it, that it did before. Now, mind you, it would then get stuck in the back of the fridge, 
but you have to get all of the air out and there, it has to be a mason jar. It can't be like an old other kind of jar. There was something about the seal on the mason jar that kept the lettuce, you know, would last forever. Wow. That's, that's a great tip. I put berries in a mason jar. I do all, I use mason jars for basically because it stores better. Yeah. And, yeah, are and those they're great the canning jars mm -hmm. with, the, with like the separate little lid then the thing that gets locked down on it? I got you. Oh. Uh, I was just going to add something to Tom uh, or tell Tom. We, I know what you're saying about Sundays, but you know what we do is when we go to the grocery store, one person will be do the meat and somebody else will do the vegetables prep. So before it even goes into a refrigerator, the like if we get a big package of chicken or hamburger, it gets divided right there and put into other bags with the date and what it is. Then it goes into the freezer. We don't even put it in the freezer until it's all um, chopped up, you know, and broken down. Same thing with veggies, like for the week. Um, we just wash everything, lay it out on towels, and then it gets chopped up and put into bags right there for the week. That's a great idea. It's yeah. It's a lot of work. Uh, we'll say that. And especially after you're done grocery shopping, right. it is the last thing you feel like doing. But I mean, instead of putting it away and pulling it all back out, right. it's best to get it all done, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I can imagine once you get it in the fridge, you're like, ah, forget it. I'll just <laughs> do it. Do it later. Yeah, always tomorrow, right? We all say that. I'll just right. do it tomorrow. Right. Well, Danielle, this was fantastic. Um, you guys on your, your organization have such, you know, it's a really great message of helping us keep food out of our landfills, but also saving us money at the same time mm -hmm. so that we're not, um, you know, going back to the grocery store three times a week and we learn the things that we like, you know, it's always good to try new things, but that doesn't mean you got to try them all in the same week. And um, now with produce coming in season, I think for all of us, this was a great lesson in um, how we can keep ourselves, you know, from keeping food out of the landfills and being a part of, you know, keeping us healthy at the same time by eating healthier foods and keeping us safe. So I thank you. I thank Make Food Not Waste for um, participating with us in our healthy living experience. Um, do you uh, want to give us your website really fast in case people want more information? For sure. So you can go to makefoodnotwaste.org. Uh, we're also on Facebook, which is Make Food Detroit is our, our name there. Uh, and, and yeah, follow us. We have, we share different tips, but we also have different event, events. We have volunteer opportunities in the kitchen. Uh, we're probably going to have a lot now that we can all get together and it's nice out. Hopefully we can have more, uh, get more get togethers. We're thinking about actually doing, uh, some canning and preserving classes this summer as well. So, uh, with this heat, we think there's going to be a, a lot of, a lot of abundance to, to save. So, uh, <laughs> so follow us or get in touch with us, join our email newsletter and, and uh, yeah, keep in touch. We'd love to hear from, from all of you and see you in person. So my garden was officially planted Memorial Day weekend. So I will probably be calling you when all my tomatoes come in at the same time. We'll take it. Yeah, absolutely. I know we're, we're sort of bracing for, for August and September when everybody's tomatoes are <laughs> Well, I will tell you, I mean, to brace yourself a little bit more, I buy from a local Sterling Heights greenhouse, all of my, my plants. And he said that they have, they, they ran out of things last year because people were at home getting great ideas. They planned and purchased and grew more this year and they're still running out. Oh my gosh. So when I went there the week before Memorial Day, they were out of like Roma tomato plants, eggplant, some pepper plants. Wow. So, I, I would, yes, anticipate that you are definitely yes. going to have some bumper crops that people will be yes. wanting to do. Okay. Good so, problem to have, though. Great problem to have. My, my team here will be getting the uh, fruits of my garden to yeah. <laughs> share with everybody. Absolutely. I just wish you could grow limes and grapefruits. That would I know, fun. right? If I could figure that out, it wouldn't be in this climate. And so maybe that's the plan. I'll move and I'll ship you all my limes and grapefruits. <laughs> that would be amazing. Well, Danielle, thank you again. Thank you for thank this you. participation and for joining us and our guests today. Are, um, and we will be sharing this online. So um, if there are tips and things that you missed, um, you can go back and rewatch. So again, great. thank you so much. And we will see you all very soon. Thank you all. It was great talking with you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Danielle. Thank you.